Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Edward Luce, um, and I have the pleasure of um, moderating uh, the book launch for, for, for Rob and Mike, who I'm sure most of you know, but uh, I've known each separately from each other um, for more than a decade. And I can safely say that in a town that's um, often vulnerable to groupthink, neither of those two suffer from any faint semblance of groupthink. They're, they're wonderful contrarians, not for the sake of being contrarian, um, but because they, they think and don't um, and, and, and are not um, slaves to fashion. And I, I've in each, each separately in their own way has been wonderfully generous to me as a journalist trying to understand this town, this country over the last um, 10, 12 years. So it's a real pleasure for me to, um, uh, to, to moderate this discussion today. Big is Beautiful is I think a very contrarian book, and we'll get into to that um, in a minute. But let, let's just start by asking Rob, um, who I'm sure you know and have got in your literature, is, is founder of the ITIF, um, originally at NIST, on, worked on the Hill, is, uh, uh, and a, a real expert in competition policy in America's competitiveness and the role of technology and so forth in, in these questions. Let's start with Rob, um, just giving an overview of Big is Beautiful, and then we can get stuck into a discussion about the very important themes that, that you, you raise in this great book, by the way. I've, I've, I've read the book. I blurbed it. I have to say I didn't, hadn't read it when I blurbed it, but since then I have read it, <laughs> and I'm glad to say my blurb was accurate to, to read this book. So Rob, um, why don't you kick off? Always a risk, Ed, when you do that. We're glad it worked out. <laughs> it worked out. So, thank you, Ed, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. You know, Ed, you mentioned uh, uh, groupthink and contrarianism, and um, a little while ago, I had a podcast. Somebody asked me to do a podcast for the for the book, and I went through the book and explained all this, and he said, "You know, nobody agrees with you. Why would you write that book when no one agrees with you?" <laughs> uh, so. A lot of people actually don't agree with the thesis of the book, and uh, the thesis of the book is, is quite simple, which is uh, overall, if we want to maximize economic and social progress in the United States, large firms are central to that goal. Uh, unfortunately, what we've evolved into, and, and it's really, it's gone through our, our history, and Mike can talk more about that. He wrote very compelling parts of the history of, of how the United States has always had a soft spot for what, uh, what he terms producer republicanism. Everybody's a small farmer or a small shop owner, and that's the source of Jeffersonian democracy. But today, what we see is this uh, new uh, demonization of large anything. So in the book, we talk about if you want to make something bad, if you want to, if you want to put an appellation on something to make it bad, you just put the word big in front of it. Uh, so big business, big government, big tech, big broadband, big pharma, big oil. Uh, our favorite was big chicken, uh, <laughs> which actually didn't refer to the size of the chickens, but did refer to, supposedly to the size of the chicken companies. Uh, we have big religion, we have big food, it just goes on and on. With the notion being everybody must know that if something is big, it's bad. Uh, and Here's the problem. When you have that, and then on the flip side, anything that's small is good, it's noble. Small business is the font of all uh, jobs, and, and, and we all know small businesses are more innovative than large businesses. And what we find and argue in the book is that that common accepted wisdom is just fundamentally wrong. So let me go through a few just facts uh, quickly to, um, to uh, stress that point. Um, most of this data, by the way, is either from census, uh, SBA, um, Department of Labor, IRS. Um, and it usually, when we define small business, we mean a business anything under than 500 employees. But we use various definitions in the book, so use that one for now. Uh, think about the following facts. If you're a worker in a large firm, you make 54% more than if you're a worker in a company with less than 100 employees. Uh, Low-income workers are disproportionately like, more likely to be employed by small firms. 
Workers in large companies receive 80 time, 85% more overtime and bonuses, 2.5 times more paid leave and insurance, 3.9 times more retirement benefits. So they're creating high wage jobs with great benefits. Uh, before the Affordable Care Act, 97% of firms with over 200 employees offered health insurance, compared to fewer than 50% for the smallest firms. Uh, small business accounts for 49% of the jobs they, they hold, but they only do 16% of R&D uh, and 18% of patents. So large firms, even, even within technology sectors, the evidence shows large firms are slightly more innovative than small firms. Uh, they are much more likely to export outside the country. They're much more likely to spend money as a share of sales on pollution control. They're much less likely to injure their workers. They're much more likely to pay their taxes. So there's only really two things of all, they're much, by the way, much more likely to have better cybersecurity. There's really only two factors where small businesses and big businesses are close to being tied. Uh, one is you hear this attack now that small business that large that we've seen this growth of income inequality, which is true, and increasingly what the progressive left has done is they've taken any societal problem we have, growth of income inequality, not enough new businesses, wage stagnation, you name it, and they lay it at the feet of large firms, and it's really easy to do. You just have a problem. Here's your solution. Problem is that when you look at the evidence, you look at the studies, you look at the data, none of those relationships make sense. Here's one on, which is on income inequality. There have been a number of studies that have clearly shown that large firms are not, the respons are not responsible for income inequality. Um, there's one study, for example, or one data set from the Department of Labor that shows that very large firms, very small firms, if you compare the top 10% of workers in terms of earnings and the bottom 10%, the ratio is exactly the same. Uh, when it comes to uh, job creation, this is sort of the ace in the hole of small, of small business advocates. Well, sure, they may not create good jobs, they may injure their workers, but boy, they create a lot of them. Actually, they do create a lot of jobs. They also destroy a lot of jobs. And that's really the thing we have to remember. Uh, most small businesses uh, in fact, on average, SBA data shows that after the first year, until year 20, average firm size goes down for, for that cohort. So they create a bunch of jobs in their first year, and every year after that, firms get smaller because they're laying workers off. So our argument is essentially that large firms are, on average, again, that's not to say there aren't individual large firms that don't fit this categorization, but on average, our performing the way we would want a firm to perform in society to achieve the goals we all want as citizens. The problem is that we have two, two and I'll just wrap up, we have two big problems with regard to that. One is that we have a, a policy field that is completely tilted towards small firms. Uh, if small firms paid the, large, this paid the same amount of taxes uh, as large firms as a share of their sales and their profits, uh, they'd be paying about $160 billion more a year. So we give them tax breaks. We give them massive regulatory exemptions. So if you're a firm of more than 20 workers, you're, it's illegal for you to discriminate on the basis of gender, age, uh, and religion and race. But if you're a small firm, you're legally able to do that. There's no logic behind that. It's just we have this view, well, small firms should be exempted they're exempted from many uh, safety regulations, environmental regulations. We give them special preferences when it comes to procuring goods and services for the government, even though that costs more for the government. So what we argue is very simple. We should move to size neutrality. <clears throat> if you're not good enough and competitive enough to make it in the marketplace, then go out of business or downsize. Public policy should not be putting its thumb on the scale of size. <clears throat> to be clear, what we do say is that public policy should put their thumb on the scale of newness, of age. And Mike and I both argue in the book, both agree, that it's appropriate for public policy to help new firms get off the ground. But after four or five years, if you can't cut it, if you, if you can't comply with the same rules to protect the environment and not discriminate against your workforce and pay taxes like everybody else, then you really shouldn't be in business. 
And the last point would be, it's not just that we, ha that we need to move to size neutrality when it comes to policy. It's that we need to move away from this demonization of large firms and what Mike and I refer to as the new anti-monopoly movement or the, what we call the neo-grandisians. For those of you who maybe are not up on your American history, uh, Justice Louis Brandeis, famous Supreme Court justice, made, his, made his, his case, his fame, was really all about attacking large corporations that were emerging uh, at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. And Brandeis had a famous line, which was, size is the mark of Cain. In other words, if you were a large firm, the only way you could get large was by sinning, by cheating. That if we moved away from all of that, we'd have this wonderful utopian world of small auto companies with 50 workers and small banks with 20 workers and small retailers with three workers. That was the Brandeisian vision. And today I worry that, uh, Mike and I both worry that what we're seeing is this rise of the neo-Brandeisian movement that just says big firms are bad, we should have aggressive antitrust enforcement to break them up. And if we did that, we would have two big, three big problems. We'd have less innovation, our per capita income would be lower. If we had the same firm size as Canada did, uh, we would all be poorer by about 3%. I don't think any of us want to become poorer by three or four percent. And lastly, if we did that, we would significantly reduce U.S. competitiveness. U.S. firms have to be big to go out there on the global, uh, fight on the global playing field. Um, and so, again, what we're arguing here is with antitrust, the focus shouldn't be on big. It shouldn't be on what antitrust scholars call uh, structure. It should be on conduct. And if big firms or small firms are abusing they're uh, abusing their role in the marketplace. Absolutely, antitrust enforcers should go after them. But this new view of just because firms are big, <clears throat> they deserve antitrust enforcement. <clears throat> My, <clears throat> excuse me, Mike and I uh, categorically reject that. So, thank you, Rob. I, I want to get into all kinds of live current policy questions that are implicit in, in what you've just summarized. For example, Facebook. We'll get into that a little bit later, but. Uh, it would be really helpful, Mike, if you could um, give us a little bit of history about why we love small and hate big. What, 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 what you call uh, megalophobia, this <laughs> hatred of bigness. Um, what does it stem from uh, in, in the American imagination? Well, the American Republic was created before the Industrial Revolution in the, in the sense that the Industrial Revolution really only took off in Britain uh, a generation uh, or two later, and then it came even more belatedly to the United States. And so uh, the, the founding myths, the founding principles of, of the United States, it's, it's a kind of uh, neoclassical agrarian republic <clears throat> where you have the militia uh, instead of the standing army, you have the, sit, the yeoman farmer, uh, the independent subsistence farmer who can grab his musket. It was very gendered and patriarchal you know, and join the militia and fight. Uh, and so, and then when you get this wave of industrialization, which really doesn't hit until the 1880s and 1890s, the railroads were the first big corporation, but it took another generation before you have consolidation, uh, creating a lot of the firms we know today, like General Electric and, and Standard, which was the ancestor of ExxonMobil and various oil companies. Th this was just a, a tremendous cultural shock. Uh, and from that day to this, uh, there's been the argument, every time you have this wave of technologically enabled uh, creative destruction, particularly if it benefits uh, uh, sectors with increasing returns to scale, like manufacturing and energy and infrastructure, <coughs> the older incumbent firms and the older industries say this is a threat on the republic, right? You know, it's destroying the, the uh, the yeoman, uh, and originally it was the yeoman farmer, then this is extended to the yeoman retailer uh, and the yeoman uh, craft manufacturer and so on. Uh, the, the yeoman bank, right? Uh, so, so we, and, and Brandeisianism and uh, William Jennings Bryan populism, that was all part of this, this resistance. And this, this is everywhere you've had industrialization in Europe in the same period, the 1900s, you had peasants' parties. 
resisting the rise of large industrial corporations. Uh, Rob and I argue in Big is Beautiful that this ideology persists, uh, but it's a century out of date. And the irony is to see progressives in the 21st century pick up on this, because if you go back in time, 100 years, most people on the center left and the left uh, either embraced or recognized the inevitability of scale. Uh, the socialists loved it, right? You know, you, uh, 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 Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate for president. And we love the trusts, it's easier to nationalize. Uh, Samuel Gompers, the head of the American Federation for Labor, the more big businesses, the better. We can unionize them. Uh, the, the, within the Roosevelt administration, the Franklin Roosevelt administration, uh, there was a tension between Thurman Arnold at the antitrust division, who, who represented this, this opposition to scale. Uh, but there were others, uh, including uh, Adolf Burley and uh, the young John Kenneth Galbraith, who thought this was anachronistic, and you needed countervailing power in the form of big government and powerful unions. Uh, but that as long as you had countervailing power to check or regulate big corporations, then you wanted to enjoy the benefits from productivity growth. And, and just on the historical point, we hear all and all, all the time about Theodore Roosevelt, the trust buster, and how TR's trust busting saved the United States from plutocracy and so on. Uh, th this is a myth. Theodore Roosevelt hated antitrust. Uh, he lobbied as president and then as a presidential candidate in the Progressive Party to replace antitrust with federal regulation of large corporations because he thought large corporations were efficient, they were useful, they were here to stay, and it made no sense whatsoever to be breaking them up artificially. Uh, his administration for political purposes undertook some antitrust prosecutions, one of which led to the breakup of Standard Oil. And as we point out in the book, he kept this to himself. This took place under his successor, William Howard Taft. He was furious. He thought this made no sense whatsoever to break up this efficient large uh, corporation. So both with FDR and TR, uh, the idea that they were hostile in principle to large industrial companies just has no basis in fact. Um, so you, uh, you do a very, very good job of making a case for what you call national developmentalism um, of, of essentially a new industrial policy. So to get sort of to the core of the strategic reasons why you believe the United States should get over this small is beautiful um, mindset and embrace the benefits of scale. What you're really talking about here is what is best for productivity. Um, so either of you, um, uh, 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 could, could you answer this question? Uh, if you think of, uh, if you think of, I don't know, air aircraft manufacturer, if you think of social media, if you think of robotics, if you think of green cars, if you think of all these things, we have China with an explicit 2025 target made in China and all kinds of mercantilist incentives for companies to hand over their technology to help China achieve the 2025 made in China. We have got that you know, on one side of the world. And then here in the United States, we have, as, uh, as Michael's just um, elucidated, uh, a, a rising politics of big is ugly and we've got to break up um, we've got to break up whether it's banks or the bit or big data. Um, we've got to break up our national champions. To what extent, in the context of China, um, is this a national competitiveness problem? So, in the chapter on uh, the there's three chapters on antitrust, and the last one is more about what we're doing today and what we should do today. And we talk about there. Uh, there are some industries where there just are few economies of scale, and if we were to get size, it would probably be because of the market cane. Uh, think about dry cleaners. There's no you know, big, giant dry cleaning industry because there's no economies of scale in dry cleaning. But there are a lot of industries where scale and size is exactly what you would expect and is exactly the result that's the most beneficial. We talk about four different kinds of industries. <clears throat> One of them are innovation industries. Uh, th this is what uh, William Baumel talks about when he talks about the fact that in some industries you have to put an enormous amount of money before you even get your first product. 
Think about uh, a computer chip. Uh, you spend a lot of money and, on, on, on designing the, the chip, on, on bu buying the machines, and the next chip that comes out has lower marginal cost than average cost. So in innovation industries, you tend to have big firms. A second is firms that just have economies of scale. Think about the car industry. It's a lot cheaper to make 100,000 cars a month than it is to make 10,000 cars a month per car. Uh, a third would be network-based industries. We see this now uh, last week with Facebook, for example, where everybody knows oh, Facebook's too big. Uh, and the result of breaking up Facebook would be to have, what, a Facebook and a headbook? And so now every time we want to post something to our friends, we'd have to post it on two different places. In other words, there's a reason why one firm became dominant, if you will, in social networking, uh, and that's because of these network effects. And the fourth uh, industry are these industries that need global scale in order to compete, increasingly against companies that are backed by their state. And so if it wasn't for that fact, uh, you know, maybe we could say, well, you know, Intel's a big corporation, it doesn't matter, maybe we could break up Intel into two. The problem is Intel is facing competitors in China that are backed by a $160 billion state fund. And we see that in aviation. Boeing is facing COMAC over there, again, backed by enormous amount of government subsidies to build a competitive aircraft industry. And we see that in industry after industry in, in China 2025. So if we go down this path of, of, of not just breaking up big companies, but perhaps even more insidious, telling them that if they become aggressive competitors, and I don't mean unfair, I mean aggressive, which is, by the way, what you're supposed to do in business. You're supposed to compete for market share. When we send them a message that says, don't be aggressive, what we're really saying is, don't compete aggressively against China, and the end result is going to be lost market share. So that, the China example, I think, sort of clarifies um, a lot of the ambivalence that people would feel on this. Because on the one hand, if you think of China social data, if you think of the kind of support uh, the Weibo's and uh, etc. are getting from Beijing, um, you get a sort of terrifying Orwellian vision of an autocratic state that is able to monitor every facet of your life and give you a social credit rating um, based on your behavior to uh, approve or disapprove and impose costs on you on that basis. And that's terrifying. Um, and a lot of people in a very different way feel that about Facebook, that it's got an extraordinary amount of history and knowledge and data about each of our individual lives that can be grossly misused. So the ambivalence here is that, well, we need, we need scale um, such as what Google or Facebook provides to compete with these Chinese behemoths, but we find scale terrifying. Um, could, could you talk, talk through that sort of profound ambivalence that we might feel when, you, when you're talking about this in the China context? Well, uh, Rob and I in the book focus mostly on non-financial business, and uh, uh, we deal somewhat with social media, but, you know, I think, I, I'll speak for myself, I don't, I don't think that the great struggle of the 21st century is between Chinese social media and sure. American social media, you know, aerospace industry, automobiles, AI, robotics, and, and so on. Uh, but I think the question, which, and, and it puzzles me, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, so, there's an old saying that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you're worried about uh, supposed Russian bots, you know, influencing the election through Facebook. It's like, oh, okay, so we'll have Justice Department lawyers break up Facebook, right? It's, well, how does that address the problem? You're worried about uh, rules regulating privacy, whether it's formally regulated or self-regulated by industry or by the company. Uh, therefore, the antitrust hammer. So I, I think this whole debate about social media is confused. I think they're, they're legitimate concerns, but I don't think it's clear in people's minds. As you say, it's like this vague feeling of unease. Uh, and I think what we need to do is sort out what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about campaigns and advertising? That's an advertising question. Are we talking about uh, rules for selling data to advertisers? Well, okay, that's a different issue. Uh, and you know, I think it's being driven by this solution, antitrust, in search of a problem to solve. 
Yeah, I would just argue, um, and this, this to me is one of those things where Washington has, has, has just fallen into a tizzy, <clears throat> this sort of irrational panic where you now get to say almost anything and it's not questioned, it's not challenged. We saw that on the hearings, frankly, where much of what was said was just factually wrong. So for example, Facebook, you know, by and large, 99%, they don't sell the data. All they do is they're, they're just a matching algorithm. And, and I ride my bike to work, and so I'm more likely, if I post that I ride my bike, I'm more likely to get an ad from, you know, Bike Nash Bar to have me buy an ad. Bike Nash Bar doesn't know that I am the person. So we should be clear about that. But, but more importantly on that is if we're really worried about that, which I don't think we should be, if we're really worried about that, we could adopt regulations. It doesn't, that's that's irrelevant, irrelevant to firm size. Would Facebook be any different in terms of our concerns if there were two of them? I would argue actually it's the other way around, that a large firm has much, much more at stake reputationally to get it right because they know that they're under the, under the, under the lens of, of scrutiny by the media, by public interest groups, and by, by the public. Secondly, on this Russia thing, I don't want to just get into this defending Facebook thing, on the Russia thing, Again, do we really think that the Russians would be any worse off if there were three Facebooks? In fact, I would argue they're better off. They would be more likely to be able to influence our election next time because you wouldn't have the scale of a firm like Facebook who can employ you know, thousands and thousands of engineers to rejigger the algorithm and to do all these other things and to hire bodies to monitor this. That's what large firms can do. Sure, and, and I, you know, you can envisage quite easily that if Google was broken up and we had several search engines, one would be a conservative search engine, one would be liberal, one would be for kittens, <laughs> um, and that actually the sort of echo chamber problem would get worse, not better. So, no, I, I'm with you on that, and I wasn't meaning to suggest that the battle between the U.S. and China, a competitive battle in the 21st century, is going to be a social media one. It's what's behind social media, privacy and data. And as you know, artificial intelligence gets better the more data it has, the fewer privacy protections there are. And China has a massive competitive advantage there in that it can vacuum up these companies, these national winners that Beijing has chosen, extraordinary amounts of raw data and get an edge in artificial intelligence. So uh, I guess my question is, should we match that? What, 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 what should be the limits in terms of our competitive response to what Chinese com the advantage Chinese companies have? Well, the United States prevailed in the global great power struggles of the 21st century, or of the 20th, 20th century, century, by selectively emulating aspects of its adversaries, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, uh, as, as late as Reconstruction after the Civil War, uh, the United States opposed anti-piracy laws because our strategy was not to have a large standing navy like the Britain and France and the great powers, but to have the merchant marine and also privateers. Mm -hmm. Under the Constitution, the Congress can hire pirates to harass enemy shipping. By the early 20th century, the United States had remodeled its military along the lines of the German general staff and the British Navy. Nevertheless, we rejected other aspects of, of uh, autocracy and aristocracy and uh, so on. Uh, so, you know, I, th I think uh, we both would agree that uh, there, you can take the same tools, the same basic set of tools. FDR used radio and mass uh, politics, you know, to rally the country in the depression against totalitarianism and Hitler and Mussolini used it to promote totalitarianism and aggressive war. So I, I think if you focus on the tools themselves as having some kind of inevitable tyrannical effect, I think that's a mistake. It's a challenge to, to uh, 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 you know, for, to have what is the democratic and republican and liberal version of a society with AI, with, with uh, you know, big data mm -hmm. and all of that. And it, it's a challenge and it will be worked out. But I don't think the, the technology or the scale by itself condemns you to an Orwellian future. Yeah, the other component here, which we, which we almost nobody understands is, and the reason I understood it, frankly, was because uh, Barry Lynn, uh, who used to work with Mike, uh, had a completely opposite view of ours. He, in this his is the book, New America Foundation. It was New America, yeah. and now was at the Open Markets. Open Markets. Uh, uh, a, a very able spokesman of For the Brandeisian breakup. position. Yes. Yeah. So Barry is very much Brandeisian. 
And in Barry's book, when, when I read it, he, uh, he was uh, praising the aggressive antitrust enforcement we had in the 50s. And it turns out the uh, Justice Department and the FTC went after scores and scores of advanced technology companies in the United States and forced them to give up their patents. Uh, when you really don't look at the history of that sordid period, if you will, uh, let me use one case, which was RCA. For those of you who are old enough, you happen to remember, we, we actually at one point had the world's leading television industry, uh, largely because of RCA, which was formed uh, as the Radio Corporation of America, was formed actually by the U.S. government uh, right around World War I because we needed a competitor to Marconi. So, this was, uh, Marconi was the Italian radio industry, even though they were in the U.S. And our military said, we need our own radio industry. So they formed RCA as a private corporation. RCA moved into televisions. They were dominant in the sense of they just had the best innovation. They had the most R&D, the best patents, uh, best TVs. And so the Justice Department said, this is a big problem. And so they forced RCA to give up their patents for free to all other U.S., for any U.S. firm that wanted them. The problem for RCA was that his, RCA historically had licensed their patents very liberally to all their competitors. And now they didn't have any licensing money. So they had to start licensing to, guess who? Sony. And if it wasn't for that, Sony would never, ever have gotten into consumer electronics that way. Same thing with the AT&T Bell Labs. A case with uh, licensing the semiconductor, uh, licensing the transistor. These were all done. The same thing with Xerox. Xerox actually had to give their copier technology to Ricoh and multiple, multiple Japanese copier companies, and within a decade had lost almost half their market share. And this was actually seen by the time by the FTC as a win, a victory, because Xerox had less market share. RCA had less market share. RCA actually had so much less market share that it went to zero. And this is what I really worry about, this sort of aggressive focus on just, you know, not respecting companies' intellectual property rights, aggressive sort of breaking them up or telling them they have to license their technology. And we, we see the same thing today. Um, there was a famous case recently where uh, you had the Lattice Semiconductor, uh, semiconductor firm uh, being emerged and um, Pretty sure it was Lattice. Uh, they merged with a, with a Dutch semiconductor company, and the Justice Department made them give up their what's called RF power business, radio frequency power business, and to just divest it. And, and I'll give you one guess what country bought it. China. Thank you. <laughs> um, you make a very powerful case in your book um, uh, of, of the other dimension of the 50s and 60s, which is uh, the industrial strategy element of it, occasioned by Sputnik, the Cold War, the pressures of the Cold War, that you know continue through s Republican and Democratic administrations, really from Truman Eisenhower onwards, the role of DARPA, etc. Um, and it's impossible to imagine Intel um, or IBM or, or um, the, these incredible sort of innovators um, in the American scene delivering, or indeed the AT&T Bell Labs and the Xerox, delivering what they delivered if there hadn't been this kind of Cold War prompted industrial strategy. Um, my question is, since you are essentially arguing for, the, for a, a, a recreation of that kind of very productive, big public-private partnership um, that produced the, these wonderful innovations, you have to look at the fact that the state side of that, the administration, um, the White House, DARPA, the Pentagon, NIST, um, was in very different hands those days than it is nowadays. Politics was in a very different shape than it is today. And that if you're going to pick winners and make strategic choices, you need to be able to trust the state to do so intelligently. In what, what way are you confident that that kind of industrial strategy today would be pursued with the same strategic intelligence that we saw yesterday? Uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, I, th I think that would be a nice world to get to. But th the other world we would like to see is, is a world that's even much easier to do, which is to just stop size-based industrial policy. So treat all mm -hmm. firms of all sizes the same. That would get us more innovation. It would get us higher wages. It would get us higher productivity. 
So just doing that alone, which is very much of, if you will, sort of a free market agenda, if you will. The second would be to stop demonizing large corporations on the basis of size. And sort of, you know, roll back this neo-Brandeisian tide we see. If you do both of those things, then we're in a position to say, okay, what could we do in an affirmative sense? I don't think there's any doubt that we, sh we have some broad sense of what are going to be the most important technologies to America's future over the next 50 years. Uh, it's going to be technologies like AI and robotics. Uh, it, 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 for all likely, probably one of the things that we're going to enjoy in 50 years are space planes. You know, sp there's new, new planes that can go from here to Tokyo in four hours. Um, what should the government do? Should the government pick Boeing? Or should it pick Google for AI? Absolutely not. The government can never know enough, and it can result in capture. But what the government can do is it could say, you know, we know these are big areas. So for example, if we're going to have an NSF budget, why shouldn't the NSF budget focus more on computer science and electrical engineering? If you look at the NSF budget in the last couple of years of the Obama administration, the budget requests were almost the opposite. They were, the biggest increase at NSF was social sciences, and the lowest increase was electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to call that picking winners, I will, fine, I will cop to that. Electrical engineering, <coughs> uh, biological <coughs> technology, computer science, those are critical. <coughs> Second thing is we do know that uh, NIST, for example, uh, manages along with DOD and DOE a program called the Manufacturing USA program. And these are public-private partnerships with big and small companies and universities to focus on early-stage pre-competitive research. That program has been thoroughly evaluated by Deloitte and others and found to be very effective. It's not politicized. And, and the reason it's not politicized is the companies are putting in about 60% of the money. So if a program is politicized, the companies don't put their own money into it. And then lastly, we have programs like DARPA and ARPA-E in, in, in the Department of Energy. I don't, I've never seen anybody argue that DARPA is politicized in the sense of, you know, we're going to pick some friend's semiconductor firm. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what we would argue in the book is actually that we do need more defense funding for innovation, that that's always been an area that's been done pretty well. And by not increasing funding there, we're cutting ourselves. So most of this can, and NIST is another organization that is very, very well run. Uh, so most of this can be done quite well. Yeah, I, I would add, uh, look, the United States is never going to be Singapore or Japan or China or even France with, with you know, this high civil service carrying out four and five and 10 year plans. It's not necessary. Uh, we've seen waves of uh, technological innovation. This is the Schumpeterian theory after Joseph Schumpeter where you have a general purpose technology, uh, the steam engine, in the first wave, and then later the internal combustion engine, the electric motor, and then you know computer information technology. And all of the countries that are going to stay at the head of the pack as great military powers and great industrial powers, they're going to adopt them. They're going to adopt them by different methods. Uh, Russia under the czars, Japan under the Meiji Restoration, you know, the United States, Britain and its empire, all in, in, had railroadization of their economies by different methods. Uh, but, you know, it, it worked out. So I, I think if you look at China's Made in China 2025 plan, you identify AI, robotics. Uh, our states do this. That's one of the ironies, you know, that, that Rob and I uh, have uh, discussed. Uh, every state, including every red, conservative, small government Republican state, uh, has an economic development agency or an economic uh, development corporation. Now, many of them target particular industries. They work with the state university system. You know, they have incentives. They, now, some of it's corrupt. Uh, the United States was incredibly corrupt in the 19th century. Uh, we surpassed Britain as the world's leading industrial power, notwithstanding all of the corruption. Uh, you know, it's a cost of doing business uh, uh, in many countries. Uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, we, will, we have always done what other industrial great powers are doing, but we've done it our way, which tends to be in a more decentralized, more market-friendly way, uh, but we've done it before, we can do it again with these new so, technologies. So if, you, if, if we're going to get to a situation where the neutral, not, not promotion of big or 
um, persecution of the small happens, just neutral tax and regulatory treatment that you've been enumerating, um, Rob. We're going to need a politics that sees big as beautiful again, where megalophobia is not an axiomatic, you know, where putting big before something doesn't mean evil. Um, if, if you talk to people, though, um, and this is why I think it's, it's such a big political problem, if you talk to people, we always have, and always have had, I'm sure, a sense of lost community. And community is about localness, it's about seeing people's faces, it's about um, in neighborhoods. And scale seems to be very alien, and you know, it also seems to be easy to imagine big companies capturing politics in the way that small businesses don't. Now, I know for small business federations do, and look at the power of the doctors and, and so forth. But how, are you going, how would you recommend a big is beautiful political campaign to work? How would you get over these human biases towards small in, in, in the economy? Well, I mean, one of the points that you, you raised, Ed, you know, do, does, do big companies have too much power? Um, you know, <coughs> when you have your own building right where you can look over the Capitol uh, and it's a six or eight story building, you've got a lot of power. I'm referring to the National Association of Realtors. <laughs> no one would say there's big realty. Uh, you know, realty firms are small. Uh, you see that with NFIB, with the there bureau. Is, there is a big realtor in the White House. <laughs> that is, there, he is a big realtor. With big hands. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this notion, so, so, so what, do, what do we do? And we argue really in the book for three big things. Number one, besides the fact that just having an open and honest dialogue that on net, large firms produce more societal and economic benefits. Uh, you know, one of the points we make in the book is there's a narrow a dialogue between some of the uh, neo Brandeisi and the anti-monopolies folks, and they were having a dialogue back and forth, and essentially one of them said, well, we can't really go after companies like Amazon on the consumer welfare standard because it is so unalloyed good for consumers, Amazon being, so we have to come up with some other excuse to go after them. So I think the, that number one is pointing out just the benefits from that. But the other three things that we point out in the book, one is um, the corporate community has not done a very good job of uh, decrying uh, their, their scoff laws within their midst. And I refer to a company like Wells Fargo, for example, who uh, you know, violated all kinds of public trust and laws and the like. And it, the corporate community, uh, you know, they should have been much more vocal of saying, the CEO, we will never play golf with this CEO again. We're never talk to this guy again. This is not what we stand for. So it needs to be, back in the 50s and 60s, there was a sense of corporate statesmen. At the time, they were all men, but scored corporate statespersons. Uh, and the corporate CEO took on a responsibility for more than just his or her firm. They saw themselves as stewards of a good society and a good economy. They've, they've abandoned that. And I think as long as they continue to abandon that role, they're going to be seen as just self-interested corporations without any, any kind of uh, loyalty. The second thing is stop defending yourself on the fact that, on the, on the reason that you, is because you help small business. Look and listen when you see how corporations today talk. Um, like Citibank, for example, has a whole series of ads and conferences. We help small business. You know, large corporations, they, they will defend their existence by saying, we've got a supplier base of small businesses. It's all true. They do. You should defend yourself on the fact that you are just big, and that in and of itself deserves defense. And the third is really going to this point, which I really think is the key point, which is um, we, we quote a very famous quote, obviously, by uh, Engine Charlie Wilson, the CEO of GM, and when he was appointed by Eisenhower to be defense secretary, in his hearing, he said, well, what's good for GM? I've always believed that, he was asked, could you deal with a conflict of interest? And he said, well, I've, I've always believed that what's good for GM is good for the country. Now, he believed it, I'm sure, as did almost everybody back then, that what was good for big corporations was generally good for the country. That today has broken down because companies have become multinationals. And I do think that if they want to restore their faith and their reputation, They've got to do a little bit better job of saying, you know, we are multinationals, but we do have a core commitment to the United States economy and to society. And, we're, and when we can, at the margin, when we have a decision between should we open that factory up in 
Mexico or keep it here and re-engineer and bring in engineers and train our workers and raise our productivity. We're going to try to do the latter. We might not always be able to. There are some industries and product lines where it's just the cost structure is so much better doing it in a low-wage, uh, low-skill labor country. But there are others where there's that case. And you see the German companies, for example, much more willing to kind of go that extra mile. So I think, you know, companies have a, they could do a lot more to improve their reputation and to sort of take away some of that demonization. On the politics point, I think ironically, one of the reasons the reputation of big business has gone down is the decline of organized labor in the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, it was actually labor liberalism that pushed back against small business romanticism in the 1920s and 1930s and said, yes, we want A and P, right? You know, they pay better, right, than these small general stores. Uh, the civil rights movement, you know, chains would serve African Americans, you know, who were discriminated against by the local oligarch in the little small southern town with the general store merchant. Uh, and since the decline of that kind of New Deal labor liberalism, on the left you've had neoliberalism, this is kind of the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party, where it's all human capital, right? So that the, the way ordinary people improve their standard of living is by going to the university and becoming a professional. So being a high school educated wage earner uh, somehow is like this, this shameful condition you should escape and you should become a college educated professional. The, uh, the Republican message was summed up to me by a Republican rather sardonically is you too can be a millionaire, right? So if you're a working class person, you wanna move up, go found your own business, become self-employed. And, and this is what is missing in our uh, political uh, discourse uh, Self-employed people, depending on how they're defined, uh, it's, it's fewer than one in 10 Americans. So nine out of 10 Americans, you are a wage earner, even if you may be a professional and maybe fees and so on, but you, you do not own and run your own small business. Uh, let's say, if you look at, uh, and these are mostly non-employee businesses, right? It's just kind of you're a consultant or, or you're a uh, you know, contractor or something. Uh, the number of self-employed small businesses that employ other people is very small. But, uh, you know, th what, what you need to do is have an alternative to this narrative where working class people are going to significantly improve their conditions by quitting their jobs and going into business for themselves. So Rob and I in the book have a rather cruel fun with the uh, new tendency to treat all new businesses as startups, right? So startup began in the tech, it means like a you know, new tech uh, co company. Now, if you open up a new pawn shop, it's a startup. If you retire and open up a b and it's a startup, right? We need more business foundations. Uh, and, and actually, it's a disaster, and Rob, Rob recited the the data about how bigger firms pay higher wages and so on. In many cases, it, you ruin people's lives if they're working for a firm, big, small, medium size, and you tell them, quit, start your own business, because most businesses fail, uh, and you will fail. Uh, you would be better off working uh, for a decent-sized firm that pays decent wages, and we've lost this discourse uh, that it is it is honorable, the dignity of work, to be a wage earner by romanticizing either the college-educated professional minority, it's always gonna be a minority, uh, as uh, progressives do, uh, or romanticizing the small business owner, which up until recently was kind of a conservative thing politically, but now more and more, it's becoming more and more of a progressive democratic thing. Now the, the median small business owner makes less than the median wage in the US. There's a good study by John Van Rienen who looked at, the, we have a whole chapter on international, and, and Van Rienen is an LSE economist who looked at France, and France is interesting because if you look at the average firm size in France, you know, how many firms with one, two, three, four, there's a big modal jump at 49. So there's a lot of French firms that have 49 workers. What is that all about? 
when you hit 50 workers, you get socked with an enormous regulatory obligations. You have to form unions. You have to have uh, all these new rules and laws. So all these firms intentionally stay at 49. And Van Rienen and his team show that that reduces, that factor alone reduces French wages by about 4%. Because, and it reduces managerial quality because people are stuck in these firms. One of the points we make in the book at, uh, which I'm, I'm still waiting for, for a good, ex well, I think we have actually have it in the book, but I'm waiting for someone else to come up with a good explanation for the crisis of firm startups, you know, the decline of firm startups, in, new firm startups in the US. This has now become one of these Washington established views. There's a crisis in startups because startups are going down. Now, startups are going down, and thank God they're going down because most startups are lifestyle businesses, you look at the studies from University of Chicago, from SBA, they're lifestyle businesses that don't ever grow and they don't make very much money. And so yes, startups have gone down in the US. That's really not the right question. The right question is, what's been the trend with high growth startups? Firms that start and then get really, really big. So Scott Stern at MIT has looked at that and he found that we have the highest rate of high tech startups in American history, about equal. We did our own study where we looked at six million, we meaning ITIF in this, at six million uh, firms in the US in 10 technology sectors. And we have essentially 50% more technology startups in 2016 than we did in 2006. So yes, we have a startup crisis because Fred and Sally are not able to open up their pizza parlor or open up a hardware store or whatever else, um, but it's irrelevant to our prosperity. What matters is high growth and we're doing great. I'm going to get into questions in a minute, but uh, just in, in terms of the philosophical challenge you are setting yourselves here. Um, you know, you talk uh, very eloquently in the book about on the right, you've got this Ian Rand sort of, um, you know, preference uh, for, for small, hyper-competitive markets where every, where no, where no player, no firm has pricing power. And then on the left, you've got what you call your Tolkien Hobbitian um, sort of bias towards small. Um, uh, the Shire. Yeah, right. Mm. Exactly. Um, uh, essentially, though, you've got you've got a problem here um, with libertarian philosophy um, about how markets should work. Uh, you mentioned France, you mentioned, um, actually India is another good example. I mean, um, you know, the Gandhi, because of Gandhian era, uh, as in Mohandas Gandhian era, regulations, cottage industry regulations, firms don't get beyond 99 people because the Indian tax and labor regulatory system penalizes success if you grow they'll come down hard on you. Small is beautiful, it's very much an ideology there. But you've got a, you've got a free market problem, haven't you? A, 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 a problem uh, of ideology with, um, uh, with the right uh, as well as the left. Um, and you want to reimagine not just the size of business, but you have to make a new justification for the, having a strong state. You need a strong state for big business to work because otherwise, regulatory capture, et cetera, becomes much easier, and the idea of corporations ruling our lives would make what you're suggesting politically impossible. Um, am I right? You're, you're, you're making a case for strong government, too. Well, yes and no. I mean, I think, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a Fortune magazine article that we cite um, by a leading Republican member of Congress, and the title of the article is Down with Big Business. And they want to guess who said that? Someone who just retired last week? Speaker Ryan. Uh, now he wrote that before he became speaker, but it's in incomprehensible that 20 years ago a Republican would say down with big business, and yet that's gotten into the Republican Party. Now why is that? There's two reasons. One of them is this notion that, the, that, that price-taking firms in competing in, in sort of atomistic markets leads to maximizing social welfare. And I think some conservatives buy that. Many conservatives who are more sophisticated understand imperfect markets, if you will, don't buy into that and recognize that, yes, maybe a firm with some pricing power uh, can, can happen, but that the benefits are so great. So, 
So you have some sort of Republicans uh, who kind of have a simplistic view of the world of markets, kind of the Adam Smithian world that we're all little firms, and then somehow we got back to that. The second tie to that, though, is that somehow big firms lead to big government and, 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 and sort of a crony capitalism. I don't think it's really big government. I, you know, imagine, imagine a world where all we had were small firms and there was no regulation, which is sort of what we have with small firms. Uh, anybody who's saying well, that should be the ideal world, that, that small firms can pollute without, with impunity, that they can, not, they can cheat on their taxes with impunity? Now, even Republicans who are skeptics of regulation, there are some regulations Republicans embrace, and I don't think they would want to say, well, in a small economy, small firm economy, we can do away with all regulations. So I don't think it's a question of the number of regulations. I think the issue really is this notion of crony capitalism, and somehow large firms are able to get their way in Washington. Uh, Mike and I argue the answer to that, and maybe Mike you can talk about it, is, is about po political fundraising reform and other things like that, again, but it's not to break up big firms. Yeah, I agree with that, but before getting to fundraising, you know, the, historically, the heartland of this Brandeisian antitrust, anti-monopoly tradition was the older American West and the uh, uh, Midwest, uh, which were agrarian and had not been industrialized mm -hmm. yet. Uh, does anyone think that the Deep South, the land of small businesses and small general stores and you know, uh, relatively small farmers in 1920 was a better place than uh, uh, the industrialized parts of, of the United States at that time? So yes, you need government uh, to crack down on the abuses, including civil rights abuses and labor abuses of firms, but of small firms, which are more likely to engage in, in abuses regarding the labor, wages, hours, payments, and so on, than larger firms. That, that's just the case. Now, in terms of campaign finance reform, uh, we, we have the data in there. As you would expect, there are certain industries, finance, uh, uh, Silicon Valley, where there are extremely high net worth individuals are concentrated. There are others, including much manufacturing, where the CEOs give and the corporations give a fairly limited amount of, of uh, money. But if you're going, and Rob and I are in favor of this, if you're worried about campaign finance, then have campaign finance reform. But why, why focus on the corruption of politics to the extent that it exists only by big firms? Uh, as we point out in the book, uh, some of the biggest uh, campaign donors are national associations of mostly small firms. So if you want money out of politics, get all money out of politics, billionaire money, <coughs> Fortune 500 money, but also national associations, you know, realtors or optometrists or whatever. Again, there's a mismatch between the problem and the solution. We have big drilling problems. Big drilling. Um, it, it, it seems to me that people in their minds might be confusing oligopoly with oligarchy. Um, and oligarchy is, of course, about the inequality of wealth distribution in, in, in America. And there are very real concerns with that and what oligarchy's impact is on politics and the capture um, of politics by the wealthy. But, but that's, that's just a thought. Um, we've, got, I, I, we've got about, sorry. Quick, quick factoid on that. Uh, in 2004, when there was a study done on this, and they looked at the top 25 financiers or hedge fund managers, how much money they made. They made more money in one year than all Fortune 500 CEOs combined. Sure. So you want to talk about money and oligarchy, it's much more in finance than it is in just sort of the normal everyday economy. Fair, fair enough. We've got about 20 minutes to um, take um, questions if the drill will permit <laughs> us to hear them. Um, so just if you could um, wait for Mike. Yeah, the gentleman there put his hand up. Just state who you are as well, if you could. Sure, uh, Dan Murphy from the Milken Institute. Uh, you said towards the beginning that you do believe that there should be antitrust enforcement against firms that abuse their market power, so to speak. Um, can you tell us what standard you would use for that? Because as you um, alluded to, there's a big debate now about the consumer welfare standard, and others are talking about things like monopsony, things like regional decline as things that you can look at in terms of market power. So. What standard would you use for antitrust? Well, 
I think the consumer welfare standard has done us well, served us well for certainly 40, 50 years. Uh, when we think about a company like Amazon, why, well, first of all, what differentiates our antitrust regime from the European antitrust regime, Europe is much more of a combination of consumer and producer welfare. They actually care about if a firm is hurt by a more vibrant and robust competitor. I think that's a huge mistake. If you're in the marketplace, if you're a competitor in a capitalist society, you get the upside if the profits are going well, you should also get the downside if a better and more effective competitor comes along. And, and the state should not be helping you out because, because you, you, you think there's too much competition. Uh, you know, lose market share, go out of business, it shouldn't be our concern. Uh, I think the consumer welfare standard fits quite well. One of the points that we point out in the book is that there's really been this amazing rise of research attempting to make the Brandi neo Brandeisian case that monopoly, quote unquote, is a problem. And one of the most important ones recently is one uh, uh, scholar at the Roosevelt Institute and two academic colleagues, I'm blanking on, on their Mar name. Marshall Steinbaum. Marshall, yeah, Marshall. Steinbaum. Steinbaum. And this has gotten enormous amount of play. Uh, journalists, Ed, your, your, your profession, you don't have a problem with that, but your profession <laughs> needs to do better. And what, what the study shows is they divide up the country into however many uh, lab, labor markets there are. And they say, in a lot of these labor markets, you have monopoly firms, firms that have more than, say, 70% of the local market. And because of that, there is wage suppression. In other words, if you want to go and work in a paper mill and you're in some town in northern Maine, you don't have a lot of choices. And so they can say, you got to work here for $12 an hour and not $15 an hour. Oh my god, this is a crisis. The reality is more than 90% of Americans live in labor markets that don't have that problem at all because they live in cities or metropolitan areas. So what they've identified is a very small share of labor markets, small towns, rural areas, and then the solution is what? Uh, so you have this paper mill that employs 800 people. We're going to break the mill up, and so one half of the mill becomes one company, and the other half of the mill becomes another company. I say that because that study is being used by an enormous array of people on the Brandeisian left to say we need to have not just consumer welfare standards, but worker welfare standards. I'm willing to actually have that argument because, the, again, the evidence is quite clear. Large firms pay 54% more in wages. They treat their workers better. So even if you were to adopt a worker welfare standard, which I don't think we should, uh, the evidence is clear. Big companies treat their workers so much better. And uh, the lady there um, in the third row back. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. My name is Li Yang. When I get into this room, I see the big sign there, rather than say how technology can improve the well-being of the general public. So if we really want to say the big is beautiful, and I do think big can be beautiful if you resolve the problem. The problem now is a big, create all sorts of problems, including destroying small businesses, individual and family, and our society and our democracy and our election process. And I think one of the gentlemen said, you are aware of the money influence of our election, big and small. But I didn't see the big corporation try to lobby the, our government not to allow the money to influence, whether you are big or small. So if you can do the right direction rather than cut in the middle, then there is a difference. And then, then now we have big corporations who victimize small business and because they take away all the small business or individual, their human capital or financial capital. Okay. So if you can really you lobby, uh, la what I mean is to lobby, a lot of lobbyists sure. are real bad. So when you bring up the point about big firms hurting small businesses, again, I don't think that should really be our standard. The standard should be is a large firm doing something that under antitrust law would be seen as abusive. Okay, but you look at it, most big companies, why do most big companies gain market share? One reason, consumers vote with their wallets. They choose to buy at a bigger company than a smaller company. Is the small company hurt? Sure. The other point here is when we look at, for example, in the book, when you look at the decline of startups, and then you divide that into what are called three-digit industry codes, in other words, co industries like um, 
commercial banking or construction or you know, hundreds of different industries. And then you say, what's the relationship between the increase in market concentration, so the increase of share of the top four or eight firms, and small firm startups? Over half of the industries where you saw declining startups in the last 15 years had declining concentration ratios. In other words, or concentration ratios that were so low they were meaningless, like uh, what, if you know the C4 of 10, the top four firms have 10% of the market. In other words, what's going on in most markets, why there's a decline in firm startups, has nothing to do with scale and monopoly. And again, in industries, you know, I use retail as a case. I'm glad that some small stores have gone out of business. The reason I'm glad is because consumers are choosing to buy from stores that save them an enormous amount of money. There's a study that was done in, by McKinsey uh, about 15 years ago, and it looked at Walmart. Walmart alone, in the 1990s, was responsible for 8% of the US productivity growth. One firm. And the reason it was responsible for so much productivity growth was because it drove productivity through its massive efficiencies. And that accrued to the benefits of consumers. By the way, interesting, interesting point here, one of the points that people make about big box retailers is that they will pay wage, high wages. Uh, big box retailers actually pay significantly higher wages than small box retailers. So again, I think we just have to make sure when we argue this or discuss it, we're basing it on the real facts. Uh, can I make one point about uh, corporations and, and lobbying and campaign finance? Back in the 90s, there were hearings on campaign finance in which a number of retired CEOs from major corporations uh, begged for campaign finance from Congress because they said, we, we, we can only say this now that we're retired. During our entire careers, we were being extorted for money from politicians. Uh, so it's not just a one-way sort of thing, right? You know, you have a powerful committee chairman overseeing an industry calls in the CEO or the trade association and says, uh, nice little industry you got there. Be pity if something happened to it, right? And so uh, uh, that, that, you know, so to some degree, you know, obviously there are cases where, where firms large and also trade associations with small firms, you know, are trying to bribe politicians into doing things. But there is this extortion element in the US and in other democracies. Fair enough. That's a very good point. Uh, yes, the gentleman over there, and then, uh, and, and then you. Hello, thank you. Uh, Alexandra Chagoussis from IFC, World Bank. Um, I, have a, I have a feeling that um, the small is beautiful is based on something um, very primitive as well, a primitive feeling about us versus them. And what I like about what you, your, I mean, your book and your thesis is that you're taking an objective stand an evidence-based stand. But my impression is that your objectivity kind of stops at the border. So a lot of the premium that you're describing about uh, wages, about productivity, also hold for multinationals versus domestic firms. But there, it gets primitive again. It's America versus the others. I want to hear your thoughts about this. Sure, so thank you. So. Uh, after you buy the book today uh, and, and then read chapter seven tonight or eight or whatever it is, um, there's an entire chapter on international. So we go through really two things. What does the evidence show, including in rich OECD countries, but also emerging and developing countries, what does the evidence show about firm size and social benefit? And then we also then have a whole discussion of what does the evidence show about distorted and, and biased policies. One of the most clear things is that the movement over the last 15 years in the development community towards microenterprises is probably one of the worst things we could have done. That this notion of informality and, and, and microenterprises and small business being the driver of, of developing nation growth, completely wrong. Uh, the, the wage gap in developing countries is even bigger than the wage gap in the US or the OECD countries between large and small. Small firms in, in, in many of these countries have a wage, wage are paying wages, productivity and wages that are sometimes 10% of big firms. And so I think in that case, what we've gotta, we've gotta re-educate or help the development community understand that this diversion that they went down is really the wrong path. And that a much more, at least size neutral path 
There's a good study we quote in there in Argentina. Argentina is the only country in the world we could find that had declining grocery store productivity over the last 20 years. You really have to work hard to have grocery store productivity decline. Now, how did they do it? Uh, they did it because they had put so many benefits and favors on small little mom and pop grocery stores, some of them illegal. They didn't have to pay taxes. They didn't have to comply with all these other rules. And then they put a little bit like uh, Algernon Bergeron, remember that? Right. That's Kurt it. Vonnegut. Yeah, Kurt Vonnegut story where all the ballet dancers uh, had to wear lead weights and the smart people had to wear gongs on it. <laughs> Essentially what they did in Argentina, they just made the big retailers, you know, lives so miserable that the entire market shifted to small bodega re uh, grocery stores. But what happened is prices went up, productivity went down, wages went down, and they suffered for it. Now, that you can take as an extreme case, but we see that all around the world. Uh, the lady here. Hi, I'm Nancy Spanos. I run a uh, blog called American System Now. Um, and I think in the ideological battle, I very much agree with big is beautiful. I, I uh, very much oppose small is beautiful when that came out as a major offensive many, year, many decades ago. But I think the major ally in the ideological battle, which was in part referred to by Mr. Lind with FDR, is Alexander Hamilton, whom I note is not much in your index anyway, I don't know if he's in your book, as the main thinker behind growing this economy. The kind of policies which he promoted were responsible for the major thrusts and growth in this country, as far as I understand it. Uh, the canals, infrastructure, the electric infrastructure, and so forth. So Hamilton is a major uh, ally, and I would think we should take advantage of that. And if people want to look at the blog, I could I could talk for half an hour, and I won't. Thank you. Well, I've written three books uh, about Hamilton, the Hamilton's Republic in uh, 1997, uh, what Lincoln believed in uh, 2004, and in 2012, Land of Promise. And I, I think we would describe ourselves as Hamiltonians rather than Jeffersonians. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, and you, you use the term American system. This was used by uh, Henry Clay uh, for a system of uh, not government control of industry, but of, of policies encouraging uh, sound finance, uh, the industrialization of the economy and infrastructure. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's what we're in favor of. That is, we do not see government is the enemy of business or business is the enemy of government, They're, they have complementary roles. Uh, you know, and, but this is at the level of the nation state. Uh, we, are, we are not yet at a world, and I for one hope we are never at a world where you have a, a truly global society because that would mean there's a global government and you cannot get a global government by democratic means, it's impossible. Uh, so as long as we're going to have democracies, we're going to have sovereign states, and they're going to have economic interests uh, as well as firms and uh, individuals. Uh, Rob, you want to oh, jump in? There's also apparently a music, a musical about Hamilton, but <laughs> I hear the gentleman there. Hi, my name is Joel Yudkin. I run a consultancy called High Road Strategies. A couple of points of questions, really. Uh, one, uh, Rob, you talked about how multinationals have lost a sense of the social contract, have lost a sense of responsibility uh, in, 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 in their nations, in their geographical areas, and, and, and said that you think it would be a good thing if they start to go back to a better sense of their responsibilities in corporate governance. And I was wondering what would motivate them to do that. They, they stop moving over. Part of this, I think, is tied to financialization of, and, and how do we end short-term, uh, you know, uh, stock, you know, ownership and that kind of thing. The second thing is, is it seems, what about mid-sized companies? I, you know, we have small is beautiful and big is beautiful now. Uh, what about mid-sized is beautiful? Isn't there a role, I mean, mid-sized companies, especially manufacturing, which I'm mostly concerned about, is, are, you know, they are both very important in the supply chains and they continue and will continue to be important. And the second is that many of these companies from 
100 to 500 employees are in smaller communities are mainstays sure. of their economies. And so, it's the German model, right, as well, yeah. I mean, the land. So when, you know, again, when the definition is 500 workers, there's a lot of mid-sized firms that are big firms in that category. Secondly, Mike and I get a very clear, we're, we're, we're not, any healthy economy is gonna have a mix of firms, and particularly in, the, in, in, in an OEM supplier world, you're gonna to have to have good, small, mid-size, and large firms. We don't disagree with that. All we're saying is the government shouldn't be putting its thumb on the scale with regard to firm size. The point about multinationals and all, I was talking to a group of German CEOs recently, and I asked them, why don't you move more of your work to China? And they said, oh, we move our work to China, but we try to see if we, we take two or three years to see whether we can re-engineer it and keep it in Germany. And if we can't, uh, we're not. We're capitalists. You know, we're, we're, we have to make money. We have to keep prices low. We'll move it to China or we'll move it to India or wherever. Uh, that's really all we're saying is, is that U.S. companies need to think more about that. Now, why don't they? Uh, part of it is a collective action problem. Uh, why would a firm do that? Well, a firm would do that really in part because maybe it, in, in the long run it makes better sense, but financial markets don't reward for the long run. But the second would be because if everybody did that, the demonization and attack on large corporations and the rise of the populist movement that sprung from that would have been less. But if you're an individual CEO, you're not thinking. It goes back to my point about the CEOs back in the 70s and even 80s. They were, they were not just firm CEOs. They were capitalists. And by that, I meant that they were thinking about the health of the capitalist system. Firms today, CEOs don't think about the health of the capitalist system. They think about the health of their firm. It's rational for them to do it, but it's a little bit of a collective action problem. So how do you solve it? I think the way you solve it, frankly, is that big companies and their associations need to start talking about this as a real problem and need to start working on solutions collectively. And I don't mean you know, violating antitrust or things like that. Uh, and I think until they do that, they're going to they're gonna continue to be attacked. And, um, you know, all we can say in our book is the evidence shows you shouldn't do that. So we've got time for a couple more questions, if the questioners are, uh, uh, are efficient. Uh, sir, uh, the gentleman there, and, and then you can be next. Why don't you do them both at once, then? Say? Do the questions both at once. I'll, I'll try to be sure. efficient. My name is Mike Ducker. I work for an international development firm called J.E. Austin. Um, I was just curious if you had any opinion on blockchain and server currencies, just because... In many ways, it's almost anti-big. It's this decentralized system that's trying to take power away from the big financial players and other big players there. And um, I, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that um, regarding that. Uh, so we wrote, ITIF wrote a report recently on FinTech that dealt partly with blockchain. And you know, a, a lot of people say, for example, you know, maybe in a world in 10 or 15 years, you don't have a centralized hub like Facebook, which really brings together, that somehow you could have this decentralized blockchain universe. That's been a fantasy of everybody since Stuart Brand and the Whole Earth Catalog and the Well. It's been a fantasy that these folks have, and our view is, in, is actually agnostic or indifferent. If that's the way the world evolves, and you can have decentralized, highly secure, and highly effective systems that are easy to use, the world is going to go in that direction, and great. What we should not do, though, is, first of all, we shouldn't allow big firms to erect barriers to that. That's anti-competitive. But at the same time, we shouldn't sort of attack big firms just because they're big. So again, the market should play that out and quite well, the evolution of technology and consumer welfare. Whatever happens on that should be, I think, is the right answer. Um, the gentleman there. Hi, uh, Eli with the International Economic Development Council. I want to ask, under this mindset, um, what recommendations do you have for local and state governments? Um, many economic development offices are lambasted for incentivizing large companies. I'm thinking Seattle with Boeing and wherever Amazon is going to end up uh, with their second headquarters. And at the same time, there is this push to really help small businesses and entrepreneurs. You know, it seems like every small town needs an incubator now. Um, do you think that push is misplaced? So, I, look, one of the points that we make in the book is if, if you, you, de, you can define, you divide the world or define industry into two kinds of industries. One are essentially local residential serving industries. So think about your barber shop uh, or your dry cleaner, your grocery store. 
you're going to have those no matter what in your community. Economic development shouldn't be focusing on those. The role of economic development is to figure out ways to afford your imports. So you have to have firms in your community, your region, your town that are exporting enough outside so that you can have jobs. So that's why if you lose a giant factory of 1,000 workers, you're screwed because you lose not just that, but all the purchasing power that goes along with it. So that's why economic development focuses on, or should focus on export firms, firms that export outside the region. Those tend to be big. So again, we looked at the average firm size of residential or local serving firms. They're very, very small on average. Average firm size of firms that export outside of a region, much, much bigger. So you tend to have that bias. Again, I, I think firms should be indifferent. I think they should be, they shouldn't be indifferent to export versus non-export, but they should be indifferent to firm size. But there are a lot of states in particular, or even cities, that have just these sort of small business procurement programs. Just because you're small, you get a, you get a, a cut rate break from the, from the government. Or they'll have tax incentives that are only apply to small firms. Those are the kinds of things that we would argue are ill-advised <coughs> and lead to um, uh, you know, uh, you know, poor outcomes for a state. So I couldn't think of two better people to give you a pro-Walmart and a pro-Zuckerberg <laughs> point of view at the same time from the same platform and do so convincingly. This is a great book, um, very thought-provoking, whether you agree with it or not, deeply researched, very well written, strongly recommend it, and a great pleasure to have uh, moderated you today. Thank you. Oh, appreciate it.